Podcast. Sit down with Pastor Brian Sandella of the Church House of Living Stones. Podcast. Get in the arena. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, whoever is listening. This is Bill. Uh, as always, I want to welcome and thank everybody for coming back and uh, suffering with me for another week. And got a real special uh, episode this week. I'm really excited. Got a special guest, and I'm going to get into it. I'm going to introduce him in a second. But I, I just want to thank everybody for the thoughtful responses I've gotten from this last episode, the, the episode about Jerusalem, about Israel, what's going on. Um, this is an ever evolving thing, and um, even now uh, I'm a week out from this as I record it. And there's been so much stuff that's just, you know, I feel like God showed me and that's just come to light. So, the one thing I can just say is get right with God and, and prepare for whatever that is. But I want to thank you guys for sharing. Uh, you're going to want to share this episode for sure. Uh, trust me, this is, this is going to be a good one. I, I got a feeling. But um, we're anywhere you can listen to podcasts. Uh, Flawedcast, C-L-E is the handle. So we're on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Breaker, Anchor.fm. Like I said, anywhere you listen to podcasts, we're on the video platform Rumble under Flawed Inc. You can find us on the Project Mockingbird social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're also on Getter. We're on Gap. All under Flawed Inc. There is a link below. Get a copy of my book, Smith's Art of Man Repair Manual. And our email is flawedincle at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, hit us up. And uh, I haven't done this in a while, but I, I really want to uh, start to get back into this, especially just as I'm seeing things. If you would like a copy of my book, I would be more than happy to give you one. Just send us an email, flawedincle at gmail.com, and I'll email you the PDF on the house. I just want people to get blessed and hopefully get challenged in the Lord. Uh, so once again, flawedincle at gmail.com. I'm not going to sell or solicit your information. Just uh, want to get that out there. So, uh, But that being said... I have a, a very special guest, a good buddy of mine, Brian Sandella. He is pastor of the Church House of Living Stones in Euclid, Ohio. And uh, Brian's got a lot of cool stuff going on in the church, and he, he's going to get into a little bit of that. But I do want to welcome and thank you for coming and being on the show, man. Yo, yo, yo. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. What a blessing and an honor to be here today. You're, my pleasure. You're welcome. And I know we talked about this for a minute, so I'm glad we were finally able to hook up and, you know, do this yes me too man it's been um what few few months now a few months yeah yep. so but um so brian has an awesome testimony this says in revelation that we overcome by the blood of the lamb which is christ's sacrifice and the word of our testimony what god has done in and through us and that's powerful because it's the idea that God works in people's lives and we get to see that it should inspire us and, and make us want to be an inspiration to others. So, dude, if you want to get into, you know, from the beginning of the beginning, wherever, start just kind of who you are, what's going on, and then just talk about, you know, the events that, you know, kind of brought you to where we intersected, where we met a little while ago. And then, you know, I'm going to jump in if I have questions or whatever, uh, sure. but please, the, the floor is yours. Man, so, you know, I could be here all day talking, Bill. Well, we could, we could do a two-parter. I mean, that's... <laughs> um, so, we got plenty of tape. Yeah, just to give you a little background of myself, I uh, I was born and raised in a small town, uh, Ashtabula, Ohio. Um, you know, I, I never wanted or needed for anything um i was actually pr probably a little more spoiled than i'd like to admit and um <laughs> i was a i was a, a, a an athlete you know i played played a lot of sports played you know basketball baseball football uh, baseball being my favorite and uh i played in the little league world series in 1997 and uh so baseball was was my favorite and i and i pursued that and um Come my freshman year of high school, um, my my mom and my stepdad were were moving uh, to to South Carolina, and uh, so I decided to go live with my dad in, instead of moving that far away. And my dad lived in in Akron, so I moved from a little town to a bigger city. Th that's a culture shock. Yes, it <laughs> the first night. 
I seen a cab driver blow someone's brains out on the bridge right in front of my house, right, right on Talmadge Avenue. It was, it, wow. so that was, you know, like, what the heck is going on here, right? Right. Welcome to the jungle. That's right. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, like I said, I had pretty much anything I ever wanted, you know, uh, you know, the nicest clothes, the, the you know, the, the, the shoes, the whatever. And, uh, so when I moved to live with my dad, I had to work for everything that I had. Right. And, um, I had to get a job and, but I still wanted all that stuff that I was used to having. So, you know, I got mixed up with some, you know, I smoked pot like everybody else did. And, and I, and I started selling it at, you know, in, in maybe my sophomore year of high school. I was I was going to a so uh, about maybe fourteen yeah fifteen 14, in that 15, about yeah. that okay okay and I was uh, I was going I actually had uh, a partial scholarship to go to Archbishop Hoban High School to play baseball there and I ended up getting kicked out of the school before the season even started so <laughs> oh man yeah it was a mess so I went I actually went to like four different high schools in three years. And I ended up graduating my junior year. All in the Akron area? So when I got kicked out of Hoban, I moved back to Ashtabula. Okay. So I was able to play baseball. And and I went to St. Saint John in Ashtabula, played baseball. As soon as school got out, I moved back to go live with my dad. Gotcha. Okay. And then I went to Akron North my junior year. You only had to have 18 credits to graduate, so I ended up graduating you know i doubled up in a couple classes graduated my junior year oh, by, the, okay. by the skin of my teeth <laughs> and then i you know i could have went to ashland university to play baseball and i my stepmom at the time had worked at kent state so i was like i'll just go to kent state and walk on and uh the first time in 15 years they didn't have tryouts because they had won the mac like the previous five years in a row so i was like withdrew from all my classes stopped going to school hmm. and i um you know, was selling dope. I went, I graduated from weed to cocaine and then, and then meth really hit the scene in Akron pretty, so, pretty well. So I just, I want to make sure I'm following it, that from your time about 14 uh -huh. until it sounds like you're a freshman in college, which I'm guessing you graduated early. So 17, 18, yep. you were doing some dirty yep. selling, start with marijuana and mm -hmm. then eventually graduating up to meth yeah then kind of everything in between yeah so, okay yeah yep. all right so you're a freshman in, in college you're not feeling it no nope. you're you're <laughs> you're involved in these extracurricular activities yes, if you sir. will yes okay sir. so we'll pick us up Along from there with many other ones yes sir so <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so like i said meth really hit the scene hard in akron uh before it was ever commercialized or people knew really even what it was and um, I, I kicked cocaine to the curb and started messing with the meth. Um, and that would have been probably around, I don't know, 2003, maybe, 2004. Okay. And, um, and yeah, it was on and popping ever since then. So um, I, I had, you know, some pretty good connections where I was getting stuff shipped in and all that. And, um, and then I started being investigated. And, and, and when that happened, you know, I just laid low, um, you know, dialed back, didn't want to, to go down that road. So, um, but then I, when I ran out of, of, of dope, I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do now? I'm, I'm out now. Right. So, um, I had met somebody that, uh, this girl actually from England, she was a gypsy, hmm. gypsy from England and, and she used to cook it. Right. That way, that, that, you know, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I never heard this from you. Yeah. You, you so you're early twenties. Yeah. You meet a gypsy from England who used to cook meth. Yes. Yes, sir. That, I mean, that, that's like a breaking bad episode yep. in and of itself, yes, but sir. okay. I just wanted to make sure I was hearing yep. it right. Cause okay. Okay. So, so, you know, and she, she had made like really good, good meth cause I was buying it from her and, and I'm like, look, look at here, you know. I'll pay for everything that it costs to make this stuff. You make it and then we'll split everything. And and so that's how I went for a while. But then I realized she was ripping me off and all this stuff was happening. But, you know, I didn't make that known or make a big deal about it because I was making so much money that I didn't want to ruin that. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, one day come, I had had so much Sudafed that that 
she couldn't handle it all by herself. So mm. she's like, you're going to learn how to do this today. Right. And I, and I had been watching her cause I, I sit there and I babysit her while she do it because she was ripping me off. Right. So I'm watching her and learning basically on my own on how to do this. And so she actually walks me through it. We did, we did it. And, and I, uh, I learned how to make it. And ever since then, I mean, it was endless, bro. So at that time I had left my, my, one of my son's mothers and I had split up and, you know, for the longest time I would be able, I, I, I deceived myself thinking, Hey, I could do, I was, I had a good job too. I was in the union, uh, doing asphalt. So, um, I had that to cover my tracks, but I always had a family. So I had, I had someone to answer to, I had mm -hmm. something to hold myself accountable. Right. Okay. And, and so, but when her and I split up, you know, I got my own place. I had a, one of my best friends living with me, and then I had my my kids whenever I wanted because I lived right down the street from mm -hmm. from my baby's mom. So yeah, so I I I, I by this time I didn't have anybody to answer to. Mm. It was balls to the wall until I got stopped. You know what I'm saying? What was it that was compelling you to want more? That I, I don't know how else to word it. And maybe I'm wrong in that, but I had a, you know, sixty thousand dollar truck. I had my own place. I, you know, mm -hmm. the rims. The, you know, I did whatever. I went to the casinos and I'm throwing hundreds in the big roller machine. Like I'm just doing whatever I want, like right. a free for all, and um, with no no accountability. Mm -hmm. And you know, I even hired a nanny to come live in my house. And uh, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> so she would help me with the kids. She'd help me get them ready for school. And and you know, if it wasn't for her, I'd have lost that union job because, you know, after being up for so long and then crashing, like she would, I woke up a couple of times to her actually putting my work clothes on me to go wow. to work. So, yeah. So she, she held, she held me on by the, you know, the skin of my teeth mm. through that particular season or else I would have lost that job too. Wow. Um, but yeah, it, it was a, uh, it was crazy. Like I didn't, I didn't have a care in the world. Um, and, and, and it started that strongly because I, I was just working for, for a while. Like I, I, I dialed back. I was just working. I wanted to do things right. And, uh, when we had split up, you know, I'm like, I got this truck payment. I got this, this, this rent payment. And now I'm by myself. I have my kids. I don't have any money to buy them anything for Christmas, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I did what I knew best when my back was against the wall and, and, but it snowballed and escalated so fast that it was just out of control. Yeah. So anyway, went through that whole year. I ended up getting busted in in the in June of that year, and it was a blessing then too. Like looking back now, realizing God's hand on my life because I was across the street from a, a elementary school. Oh. So you know they were going to charge me right. So but it was summer, so school was out, so they didn't charge me with the child endangering being oh, in a yeah. school zone. So it was just like you know just little blessings that I can you know have gratitude for now. But you know back then I thought it was just the uh, you know the luck of the draw or whatever. Right. <laughs> Um, stupid cops. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, they, they hate, they, they hated me. Uh, and that was in Cuyahoga Falls and oh, okay. man, they, they, they wanted me, they hated my guts, man. They were, they were out for blood. So anyway, I ended up taking a plea deal on that case. Um, the, the girl got busted with me and, and the she gypsy? was, yeah, she was here illegally. Right. So, oh, okay. so they, they, <laughs> on top of all on that, top of all that <laughs> right. Well, and, and it was because she was, she could have got her citizenship, but she was so high all the time uh -huh. that she just never went to go do it. Oh, uh, right. So okay. they, when they busted us, you know, they gave her her state time and then after she did her state time, they were supposed to, the immigration police were supposed to come get her deport her. and deport her. And she had a daughter here. So mm -hmm. she never, they had never ended up deporting okay. her and she ended up only doing like nine months and then got out. But it was, yeah. So, uh, I ended up taking a plea deal. Um, they gave me four years probation. So no, at this time, no, no time served. No time served for that. Other than, case. you know, yeah. just broke okay. But I mean, it was a huge case. You know, I, I, I made the front page of the newspaper. I was coaching my kids' baseball teams at that time. And, you know, they, they kicked me out of the league. Mm. Uh, they said they didn't want me around, you know, they didn't feel me comfortable around their chill, like all this stuff, mm. you know, and, 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 and I really drug my family name through the mud. And, uh, 
So after that case, you know, I was, I was scared to death. Like I, I, I was scared of my own shadow. I, I quit doing everything. I moved back in with my dad and I, uh, I was going to work, coming home, taking a shower, eating, going to sleep. And I, and that's all I was doing. And you know, it's funny that you, you were talking about breaking bad. So I never watched that show ever. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then during this time, I'm like, yeah, I'm just sitting here. Let me watch this, right? And I watched the first three episodes, and I went back out and cooked dope again that night. Wow. Yeah, so it was like huge trigger. <laughs> wow. So it, like it, you, so you saw this and you you missed it, or like what? What I just, was that? I didn't care to watch it because I, that I was, that was living, living it. I was living it. Okay. And, and it was so that that drug, like it was more of an addiction of cooking it than it was actually doing it. Okay. Because so, so at the time you were not only selling, mm -hmm. but you're also using. Oh yeah. So absolutely. to quote NWA, you know, you're getting high on your own supply. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. And it was endless. It was because endless you were because I'm making, making it myself, right? Okay. <laughs> so yeah. I had whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and and however much I wanted, and and with meth, you know, it it, it keeps you up. It get it 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 gives you a false sense of power. First of all. And then it makes you think that you're, you're, you're thinking smarter, you're getting all this kind of stuff done, but really all you're doing is treading water. You really ain't doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's like one big day. Hmm. And everybody that buys it from you, they're going to keep buying it until it's gone because they want to keep staying up, right? Right. So in order for me to catch all them sales, I got to stay up with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm up seven, eight days at a time. I'm sorry. I, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you you were awake. Oh yeah, for a week plus. A week plus. I mean, there there's been oh, a man. there's been a a, a a bit where I went over thirty days without actually sleeping for any like if not I even like sitting, a cat nap. Yeah, well, like a cat nap. Like I'd sit down in a chair mm -hmm. and I would fall asleep, and then you know someone would be like, "Come on, let's go," and wake up, and I'd be, go right back to it. Wow. Yeah. So it. I mean, it was. And that's got to be doing untold damage, just. Not only you know mentally and spiritually, yeah. but to your body. I yes. mean, we need that rest. That's you know? right. That's right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then, sorry. You know, I just no. You're good. My, like, my motto was you can sleep when you die. You know, like that's what right, that's right. how I used to be, man. And uh, so, anyway, it's like one big day, right? And okay. Then, then on and popping. So now I'm on, um, I'm on probation. Um, I end up, you know, go, fighting that case for like 13 months. They finally give me the plea deal, and and I take the probation and. And now I'm I'm cooking dope again. Boom. But this time I moved, right? I moved to Cleveland. I'm like, I gotta get out of Akron, right? So I moved to Cleveland. Now in in the midst, this one when Benita, my wife, so she her and I have known each other since first grade. We went to elementary school okay. together, you know. You guys we, are neighbors, right? We're or, in the same neighborhood. Same, yeah. Okay. Same okay. neighborhood. And we um you know, she was the first girl I ever kissed in my life. Like, we Aww. had a crush on each other, but we never called each other girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. Right. Like puppy love kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So so I move away. She moves to North Carolina after, oh. after high school. But her and I always kept in contact, right? So, you know, I'd always try to get her to come here. Like, we're both Steelers fans. So I'd, you know, hey, come on. I'll take you to the Steelers game. You know, Wait, you, you're that. both Steelers fans and you try to get her to come to Cleveland? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, because of my 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 well, I mean, <laughs> you you do realize Pittsburgh's like two hours away. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. But my uncle my uncle has season tickets, so oh, okay, so we okay. could I went to every every home game, right? I see. So okay. I'm like, come on, we'll go to the Steelers game. We'll stay in Pittsburgh for the weekend, you know. To, and and but she would never come. Hmm. So then finally, after like 20 years. You know, she's like, "Hey, I'm I'm coming to Cleveland. I want to see you." Now, and, does she know what you were doing? No. Or did you you kind of hit her or isolated yes, her from all that? Yes. So okay. she had she didn't have a clue what was good. What, what, what do was you do you think <laughs> do you think she wouldn't have like had the feelings for you or been a friend with you or that? Why do you think you hid that from her? So it, it was at a at, to a certain point I did, and then I revealed it all to her. Okay, you know, like oh, so, yeah. Well, obviously so, she's gonna. Yeah, if she you didn't know Benita, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to be the one to break this to you. Yeah, no. So so she so she comes here right, and she's flying back and forth from my. She was going to nursing school in Miami at the time. And Miami, she was, Florida. Yes. Okay. And so she was flying back and forth from here to there, 
you know, anytime she had a break from school. Okay. And, you know, this went on for probably three, four, five months. Now, I assume she was living in Miami. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so... You know, she's coming, you know, she's seeing me ride around in these, in the, in the, you know, these vehicles with rims on them and we're doing whatever we want to do and all this stuff. Right. And, uh, she was living it up too. You know what I'm saying? You know, she didn't, she didn't know. She knew I had caught a dope case and she knew I was fighting. Like she, she came right at the tail end of that. Okay. And she knew that, but, but I don't think it registered in her mind, like what it actually entailed. Right. She's probably like, oh, this is Brian. Yeah. I know. Right. Right. This is Brian. Yeah. <laughs> so. Anyway, January comes. She graduates from school. Okay. I go down there and move her back up here. So now she, she's moving back to Ohio, to Cleveland, to live with me. And, you know, I just turned her life upside down. Hmm. And she had not a clue what she was getting into. And, hmm. you know, I'd be gone days and days at a time. And, you know, she'd call and wouldn't answer my phone, you know, because I'd be cooking mess, right? And she's like you know get on me well why you don't ever answer the phone when i call it i'm like well listen why don't you come with me one day and you can see what i do and you'll understand why i don't answer my phone every five seconds when you call right so that that mistake i made bringing her with me hmm. and and you know i i showed her what what i do and 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 she just like i don't know what the heck was going through her mind like i could only imagine you know right and uh and she i, I I'm assuming, I don't know, but this probably, like, at some point, this is, like, everyday life to you, the yes. life, this lifestyle you've created. So you're probably, this is, it just is what it is, right? Yep. I got to assume that this is just, like, wow, like, mind blown, like, freak out, like, what is going on kind of a moment for her, right? Yep, yep. Okay, so you, you caught her just out of left field mm. with the reality of where you're at in the world she's now becoming a part of. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and so she, I mean, she'll tell you, like, you know, she, like, I would leave her at home all time and now she's she, this point in the story you know she's she's pregnant okay right and so whether she felt like she's trapped now or or whatever right she stays but i leave her home alone you know all the days ain't no telling when i'm coming back you know what i'm saying and and then or so, even if you're coming yeah, back or even if I'm uh, i mean back, i don't right? want to glorify anything yeah. but i mean that's i mean <laughs> when i would right walk, i mean that's yeah. like a reality absolutely and, okay. and i would walk in the house sometimes and she'd be like, let me guess, you got abducted by aliens. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, actually I did. You know, like that's how the crazy stories that I would come home with, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that they all really happen. But if you were telling a, a, a person that has nothing to do with that lifestyle, they're looking mm -hmm. at you like you're off the chain. Like you're, you're right. you know, like you're, you just mm -hmm. lost your mind. But those things really did happen. So, so the craziness and what someone might consider a normal life. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're about ready to have a kid. I'm sure she's probably working or whatever, yep. trying to establish whatever kind of normalcy she can. And then you're, you're, <laughs> this is not, I mean, you guys are in two, yep. you know, not even, not even on two separate pages. You're not even in the same book. That's right. Okay. So yeah. just, you know, I, you know, you talk about culture shock from going to Asha Beulah to Akron. Yep. I mean, this is like yep. infinite yep. culture shock. Yep. Okay. Yep. But she, she was a ride or die. She stuck with you. She stuck with me and, um, you know, but, but, but to credit her testimony, um, you know, she got to a point in her life to where she just accepted that this is my life. Hmm. Like, this is just it. Like, so, as a, def like, defeated kind of a way? Or, yep. like, this is... Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, okay, this is my life. I just got to deal with it. I can't keep fighting it. You know, because she hmm. would fight... She would pull, you know, stunts, like, you always use the kids. Because she knew that if she used the kids, then I would come running. Hmm. Like, I'd drop whatever I was doing to go. And then I'd right. get there, and she's like, well, you know, we need formula. But I get there, and there's a gallon, you know, thing of formula this big on the counter. Okay. And I'm like, you know, you lied to me, you know. But hmm. she was just doing that stuff to try to get me to stay home, to come home. Because, you know, I can't can't blame her. Like, she, you know, she was right. alone in, in, in a prison, but it was our own house, you know. Right. The illusion of freedom, but right. that that be, feeling mentally yep. and emotionally, probably like in that bondage, and like I, there's nothing I can do. I can't go anywhere. I can't talk to anybody. That's right. 
you know, I, yep. I, you know, because God only knows at that point what's going to happen to everybody. Yep, to not everybody. just you, but to her, the kid, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just even trying to now really put that in perspective, that's like just overwhelming for me to even think about. Yep. And that alone, this is her life. It's her life so, for, for a good solid four years, probably. Wow. Yeah. So, And you were on ho- the probation this whole time. So I was on probation this whole time. Okay. So, and, and, and then, you know, leading up, like I, I ended up, you know, I'm in, I'm in Cleveland and, uh, and I realized how easy it was to assemble chemicals in Cleveland, um, because versus Akron, because everybody, like they had their own meth task force in Akron. That's how bad it was. Everybody was cooking meth there. Right. Okay. So in Cleveland, it's like unheard of. Like nobody even knew what that is. You know, hmm. it was more of a heroin scene there, opiate scene. So, like I, I discovered how easy it was to go to to the store. Like I could go to Walmart and buy a whole meth lab, and nobody would even bat their eye at me. Like I just didn't wow. walk through the register with all that stuff, right? But in Akron, you'd have to go buy one particular item at. At, at, individ, at, at all these different stores and it would take you two days to assemble everything that you needed to, to cook it right wow. so cleveland boom i'm at walmart i go through the line you know i got benita now buying sudafed pills for me and wow. you know she's six months pregnant and they're not even asking her any questions why she's buying sudafed pills because you know, it's just the, not on the radar not on the radar not on the radar hmm. you know so and and i had come to find out I had, I had even lived next door to a cop for seven months didn't wait, even so, know it so hold on wait, wait Wait, wait, wait! <laughs> I got, I got to stop you again. Your the first catch, the case you caught, you were living in right next to an elementary school. Yes. The, this next season, yeah, you're living right next to a police officer. Right next to him. There's a house in between ours, right? And you, knew, you, I assume we knew each other. It, I mean, your name. I mean, he, he, he would. I mean, I don't know. He knew something was. Or you're at least friendly. Because, I mean, yeah, yeah. But he worked midnights, so he okay. would always ride. You know, come down the neighborhood because that's his where his house was. Yeah. And yeah. he'd always see us in the middle of the in the middle of the yard, like changing oil or doing some crazy off the wall thing that you would do during the daytime. But now we're doing it at night nighttime. You know, because <laughs> we it's just like one big day to us, right? Right. You don't sleep for a month. That's I mean, right. You know, you got to change yeah. the oil at three o'clock in the morning. Right. So, so you know, he was suspicious. Don't get he was sure. he was suspicious. So anyway, he lived next door for seven months, and I'm cooking dope in my attic of the house. Oh, okay. He ain't never had a clue. You know what I'm saying? So wow. it's like, yeah, it, it was um, it was crazy. So, but in Cleveland, I couldn't find any. Nobody did it. Nobody did meth, so I couldn't mm. sell it to anybody. Right. Okay. So now I had to cook it in Cleveland, but still drive to Akron to get rid of everything. Okay. And and then that that was where the clientele was. So I, then I come back, and. uh and one night, you know, Benita told me, like, I, I had woke up because when, when I would fall asleep, she would take my phone and go hide it or put it on vibrate. So it would I wouldn't hear it and it would keep me there sleeping. Right. Okay. And and one night I woke up and I was going to cook meth and uh, she's like, don't go, you know, don't go. Hmm. And I'm like, man, I got to boom, boom, boom. Right. And I and I left and I got pulled over on the highway in, in willoughby hills <laughs> of course with a whole meth lab in my trunk oh and uh yeah so that was the last case i caught and that was in 2015 and you know i made the pay you know the newspaper then to you know 30 year old man with a 19 year old girl mobile meth lab and you know they mm. they made it seem like i was riding down the highway cooking meth but right you know i wasn't doing that that seems impossible, but yeah. yeah. But no, there's people that yeah. do it. It's crazy. There's people that do it, bro. But but I was never uh, like I'm like that's the stupidest thing I ever. So like, why would you do that? You right. Know? Well, yeah. but, but right. They do it, right? Okay. Okay. So I catch this case, and um, I was on. I was still on probation, and I had four years over my head from that case in Summit County, and they never found out about it. So now I caught it. So I was supposed to get whatever they're going to give me in Lake County mm-hmm. plus the four years I had over my head. All right, because you broke your uh, probation. Probation. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Caught a new case, new felonies, everything. So right? you're uh, you, potentially, it, had that worked out, you could have been looking at how much time? Probably out of eight to ten years, maybe. Wow. Right? So it just depended on what they were going to actually, you know, charge you with. Yes, so, right. Yeah, okay. So anyway, the girl that was with me took the charge. Right. Because mm. she knew that, too. 
She's like, yeah, it's mine, right? On the side of the freeway. And the, the cops were like, oh, you better hope. Uh, you're going to put this on this girl and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, bro, you know, I just picked her up. We're going camping for the weekend. She had a book bag, and I told her to put it in the trunk. I thought it was her clothes. Well, I'm supposed to inspect her book bag. You know, that's right. what I was telling the cops. And and they're like, you better hope none of your fingerprints come back on this, none of your DNA and da-da-da-da-da. So, like, seven months go by. I never heard a peep out of anybody. So I figured... They never got my DNA. They never got my... And all of a sudden, come... Uh, this was... I caught the case in May. Come November, boom, I get the indictment papers at my house. That they tested everything. Everything had my... They charged me with manufacturing. They charged me with illegal assembly, criminal tools, possession, all the stuff. Wow. Plus, plus, when they got her to jail, they got her to tell the truth anyway, right? So, she went... She goes on the run after our arraignment. And I'm like, man, I'm like, I got to, if they find this girl, they're going to make her say whatever they want her to say and da, 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 right? I got to keep her safe, right? Wow. So I hid her out in my attic. So me and Benita are living in our house, and I got this girl living in our attic, and nobody knows about it, right? <laughs> and wow. I mean, it's for real. Yeah. So one day, like, I would give her the key to our house. So I'm like, you can, I had cameras set up everywhere. So I'm like, you see, if you don't see my car in the driveway, whatever, you know we're gone. Go ahead, go downstairs, get something to eat, take a shower, whatever you need to do. Well, from her passing out and being asleep for a while, right, she wakes up and looks on the camera and sees that my car is not there. Now, I had already went to work, came home, and then went to do a side job. So now it's evening time, but she don't realize what time it is. She goes downstairs and opens up the kitchen door, and Benita's standing in the kitchen. And Benita just, you know beat the crap out of her but i'm like benita i'm like you this is my only chance you know like if the cops get her i'm done for it, right you right. gotta we gotta keep her on ice so benita beat her up and still let her stay there right <laughs> still let her stay there okay so anyway okay. the girl gets she takes off boom whatever so i end up taking a plea deal they they got it down to an illegal assembly of chemicals which was a felony three and they offered me that I had a potential to get put on probation. So I'm still getting high, right? I go to the probation officer to sign up for probation, and I fail the first drug test. So I'm like, you know what? I ain't even going back. I took the plea deal, but I went on the run. I never went to my sentencing. So now I'm on the run for at least like a year. Wow. And we're living in Cleveland. And uh, and I'm like, we need to get out of here. So she, her parents had been begging us to come down to North Carolina. So I'm like, whatever, let's do it, right? I'll get out of here. Right. We'll go down there. At least I could work under the table. You know, my thought process was there's a lot of immigration down there. You know, a lot of people are coming over from Mexico and they're working illegally. You know, what's the difference if I do it? Right. Yeah. So we go down there and brother, the first 30 days I went and I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't getting high. I wasn't doing anything. And then I met somebody and I was like, man, I ain't got high in 30 days. You know, get, see if you can get me something, blah, blah, blah. I get hooked up down there. Ended up meeting a guy who was, you know, high up in the in the outlaws motorcycle. And now I'm plugged in. Now I got anything I want, whenever I want, however much I want. And I'm in a different city and a whole different state. A whole different state. Wow. And the way that they sell dope down there, they try, well, the way they do anything in North Carolina is they get the max dollar for anything. Like whatever, like if if they came to paint your walls, they would charge you the ultimate maximum because people are paying for it. So you can't blame them, right? Right. So the same thing with selling drugs. They're going to max it out. And I'm like, what the heck is going on here? This ain't how I learned how to sell dope, right? (laughs) Right. I'm selling it cheaper, faster, and, and it's turning over and I'm making more money faster. Right. So I started doing that. And then I'm now I'm selling dope cheaper than the guy I'm getting it from. Wow. And so then I start taking his people and their people. And these, now now I'm on the run in Charlotte, and everybody in this big city knows who I am. And, it, and it's just, it blew up out of control. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just out of, I'm an animal, bro. I'm out of control. I'm, I'm driving over state lines uh, with the kids in the car. Um, I got guns and pounds of meth with me. And, and on the run, wow. right? Like, I didn't have a care in the world. Right. And then finally... I had sold to an undercover cop. Ah. Yeah. 
and in the way that like, it was so smooth how they did it right and they caught me off guard um i was actually going on vacation my son angelo was coming down to go on vacation with us for his birthday and i had sold to the undercover cop the day before and so benita and i were thinking like okay well now they're at least going to build a case on me right but they didn't so what happened what i come to find out there a guy gave the cop my number because it was a dude that i used to sell dope to but he didn't do meth he did heroin so he would just sell meth to pay for his habit of what he did, right? Mm -hmm. And he nodded out one night, crashed his truck, and the cops were like, hey, give me somebody's name, we'll let you go, right? So they, they did, they gave me my number. So the cops, they text me, and they're like, yo, da-da-da, uh, they gave me this number, you know, and, and they the first people, they were tripping, and they gave me this number, like, and I'm like, who is this? And he's like, oh, this is Tone. And I'm like, do I know you? And he's like, yeah, man, I was at the Fairfield last week with, with such and such. And I'm, he's like, you know, the guy in the blue Jeep and, and the guy that gave him my number, his name was Billy. He drives a blue Jeep and he <laughs> lived right next door to the Fairfield. And I, I had uh -huh. served him up there. Right. So everything he was saying was making sense. Lining up. Lining up. And I'm like, OK. And he's like, man, but that guy, he does heroin. You know, like I don't get down like that. And I'm like. Yeah, me neither, right? Right. So he's like, "Listen, all I need is an eight ball, and I'm no, I'm not willing to pay any more than one seventy five for it." And I'm like, "Ding, right? One seventy five? I'm like, I was selling eight balls for eighty dollars, right? So, and I'm going on vacation. I'm like, cha-ching, right? Right. So I'm like, all right, meet me at Walmart. And uh, so the guy's like, okay. So we're on our way there, and and he and he texts me and is like, hey. <laughs> I don't get paid till next week, bro. I only got a hundred dollars. I can't buy an eight ball. I'm, I'm only gonna be able to get like a gram. I'm sorry. And I was like, bro, it's cool. I'll give you an eight ball for a hundred dollars, right? So he's like, oh, sweet. And I was like, and you ain't gotta mess with those guys anymore. You can just come to me directly. So I go there. He texts me. I'm here. I go out of the store and I go out to serve him up. And he comes up to the car and I'm looking at this guy like holy cow like clean cut light skinned black guy you know lined up real nice and i'm like man this guy don't do meth right, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what i'm thinking in my head but i'm like ah, oh, yeah, maybe he's just you know using it to mess with some girls or something i don't know so i give him i throw it on the seat he throws the money on the seat and he's like yeah it's all there count it count it i'm like okay buddy and i put it in my pocket and I, I drive away and i'm like holy cow i'm like that dude look like the cops right so I go around, go back inside the store, and I, I tell Benita, I'm like, man, that dude look like the police. She's like, what do you mean? You know, I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Like, right. you know, and now mind you, this time Benita knows what I'm doing, right? She, she even quit her job. Like I was making so much money, she quit her job, and, wow. and you know, raising the kids, raising the kids, everything, right? So, um, so she's like, well, at least we still get to go on vacation, you know, like, cause we're thinking, okay, yeah, you're right. You're going to try to build a case on us. Well, that very next morning, uh, we had to take the kids to school and something said to me, put that up. And I, you know, I still had a couple of pounds of meth left and a, a couple of pistols and, and like, put that up. And now mind you, every time I left my house, like we lived in the hood, right. And everybody in there knew what I did. So I would take everything with me. Every time I left, I take all the money. I take all the drugs. I take all the guns because I didn't want them coming in and robbing her. Right. right. But this time something said, put it up. So I went in my bathroom. I got my drill. I took down the vent in my bathroom. I put all the guns up there, put all the dope up there. And I, I said, all right, let's go. And we left, we took the kids to school and we were right by those Fairfield, it, right by the Fairfield Inn. So Billy had made a, a uh, an apartment in a storage unit. Mm. Like he lived in it, right? Okay. And so I had the gate code and I would pull in and I'd go sell him drugs and then I'd, you know, pull out and that's how he did it. So I pull in, but he's like, where are you going? And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to talk to this dude, see if he's going to, you know, act funny to my face because I was calling him the day before. And he's like, oh, oh, yeah, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me call you back, cause I'm like, yo, you get this dude my number, right? And he's like, uh, 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 right. So I, I, I go there, pull in, I put the code in, 
I go to pull down his aisle where his storage unit is, and the police got the place surrounded, bro. I drove right into him. Wow. And I'm like, holy cow. I'm put in reverse, and, and I try to pull out of there. I'm so nervous. I, I can't even put the coat in right on the gate. And now this by this time, the police are behind me. And, I, and the manager come out, lifted the gate up. As soon as I went through it, they lit me up. Pulled us. They're like, get out the car, Brian. Get out the car, Benita. Benita's looking at me like, how the heck do they know my name, right? Wow. And uh, so they pulled me out of the car. And, uh, you know, I had reverse looked up the guy's, the phone number the guy was calling me from the day before. And it came back. It said Carson Officer, right? <laughs> and I, and it, so I was tripping. Like, I'm thinking, man, I really did settle the cops, right? So when a guy pulls me out of the car, his name tag is bad says Carson on it and I'm like holy I knew you I knew it he's like you knew what I was like I knew you was a cop he's like how you know that and I'm like don't don't even worry about it right <laughs> so then now here comes the guy the clean cut black guy around the corner in a uniform uh, and I'm like oh, like I knew it right so I had a bunch of money on me I handed it to Benita I was like here hold this she puts it in her purse. They take us out. They go search the car. And they're like, you know, he, he was being real cool. And I was like, he come walking across the parking lot with this big stack of money. And I'm like, hold on, bro. Like, I'm like, I just took that out of the bank. Like, we're going on vacation tomorrow. And he's like, I got I to gotta run this to make sure none of the serial numbers are on this that I, that I gave you yesterday. And I was like, all right, well, let me be honest with you. I was like, one of those stacks of money is going to have that money in it. The other one, like I really just took out of the bank. We're going on vacation, right? So he sat there and he ran every single serial number. Brought me back the part of the money that didn't have it in there and gave me half of it back. And I'm, and that just blew my mind. I'm like, bro, in Ohio, the cops, they're taking everything. <laughs> they're going to hide it. They're going to conceal it. They're going to keep it in their pocket. They're going to do whatever, right? And uh, and so they were being cool. They were letting me and Benita talk. They were letting me smoke a cigarette and uh and then the one cop comes up and goes, hey, we want to come look around the apartment. And Benita looks at me, and I'm like, you know. And and they're like, she's like, no, you're going to have to get a warrant for that. And he's like, oh, cool. Hey, she said well, she wants us to get a warrant. All right, cool. We'll get a warrant, right? And I'm like, I'm like, Benita, like, come here. I'm like, listen, I'm like, you know where I put that stuff. And I'm like, if they come walk, they're not going to find that. I'm like, let them walk through. I was like, if they get out of control and start tearing stuff up, I said, then you stop them and tell them to get a warrant. Right. I said, because if they get a warrant right now, they're going to come in there with dogs. They're going to tear that apartment apart. Right. So she said, all right, you can come, right? So they take me to jail. They go over the apartment. They walk through. They found a scale. They took it. They said, we got to take this. Boom. Thank you. Boom. And they left. And, and I'm like, holy cow, right? So now while I'm in jail, that's when I cried out to God. Hmm. Now, up until this point, uh -huh. what were your thoughts or what was your relationship with God or to a God or any kind of spiritual experiences or knowledge that you may have had? So I was born and raised in a Catholic church. Okay. Okay. So I had an idea who God, I, I knew God was real, right? Mm -hmm. I believed there was a God and I prayed, you know, when I needed something, right? Right. right. But I had this, I, I knew who he was. Right. So okay. I can't discredit that. But I was so superstitious. Like I, I wore a rosary around my neck and I wouldn't even I wouldn't even cook dope unless I had that rosary. Hmm. Right. Like I would turn around, go all the way back home, get it before I would even go cook okay. dope that at that time. Right. So that was my basis of, of spirituality then. OK. But I always had a, this idea, man, if I surrendered, like if I gave my life to God, I. I knew I wouldn't be able to live the life I was living and I wasn't ready to let that go yet Yeah. at that time in my life. Right. So I, I, I'm in jail and I get down on my knee, like my whole life flashed in front of my face. And, and I, and you know, I realized how many times I let my parents down and my wife down and the, the, the lives I was destroying, you know, with the drugs, I, I let my kids down. Like this ain't the father I want to be. And, and I, and I cried out and I said, God, I'm done. I am, I'm done with this. I promise you I'm done. Mm. Please help me. And I, and I sincerely called on the name of the Lord, right? Okay, so after that, a guy that I used to sell dope to knew a bail bondsman in the state of South Carolina, right? So he calls this lady. She comes into North Carolina and bonds me out. All I had to do was give him the rest of the dope that I had, right? Mm. So I get rid of that, give it to him, 
the money that Benita had left, she put to the bail bondsman, and the lady bonded me out. She put me on an ankle monitor. She paid for it. And then when I got out of jail, she's like, listen, I know you have a family. I'm not trying to take all your money here. Take $1,000 back. Hmm. And I was like, you know, blown away. And this lady don't know me from anywhere. Right. right? And that's her living. And that's her living. That's right. how she makes her money. Right. Right. So I'm like, wow. So now I get to go home. Right. In, in the state of North Carolina, they called it a fugitive warrant. Right. Okay. So they gave me, I had a, I had a warrant in Portage County. I had a warrant in Lake County and they, they, um, gave me two $50,000 bonds for those fugitive warrants. And this blew my mind because I'm like, man, in Ohio, if, if, if you're on the run and you get caught, then you're but sitting in jail till you go to court. And then you're not even going home. You're just going straight from prison from court. Right. So for them to let me bond out. While I'm a fugitive on the run, like it didn't make no sense to me, right? Right. So I bind out. I get to go home for 30 days, and and that's the time I'm like, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm I'm done getting high. I'm, so I got clean, right? Mm -hmm. I got my family a little bit in order because now they had to get a governor's warrant in order to come and get me, right? So mm -hmm. they about 30 days go by. Mike Dewine signs a a, a, a a governor's warrant, and they come. And, and arrest me at my house like on a Sunday morning one day they take me to jail and I'm at jail and, and I have now they gave me a, a habeas corpus which uh they have thir Ohio has 30 days now to come and get me right mm -hmm. or I could go back in front of the judge and ask to be released so I start reading my bible right I'm reading my bible now and this this guy had given me he came up to me. He's like, listen, I got this, this Bible, man. You got to check it out. He's like, it's called the CEV version and it's complete plain English. Like there's no these or thou's or arts or you can just understand it. And I, and I said, okay, cool. Right. He showed me how to get one. Well, I got it and I put it on my shelf. I never read that one. I was still reading it. Like, I think it was a new King James version. Right. Okay. But I was reading it every day and, um, something spoke to me again. Right. I, it was the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know that at the time, right? Right, right. And it said, put that down, read out of that other Bible today. And I'm like, okay, right? So I'm in my cell doing my reading. I put that down. I go get the other one. And I open it up in the exact same spot where I was mm. reading the other one, right? And this is what I was reading. Let me share this with you. Hold on. Give me one second. Okay, so it says, never stop praying, especially for others. Always pray by the power of the Spirit. Stay alert and keep praying for God's people. Pray that I will be given the message to speak and that I may fearlessly explain the mystery about the good news. I was sent to do this work, and this is the reason I am in jail. So pray that I will be brave and will speak as I should. Ephesians six eighteen to 20. Wow. And so, right. So if I would have read that out of the King James, the new King James, it wouldn't have said it like right. that. Right. So I, that was my aha moment. Like I, I dropped to the knee, to my knees and I'm crying and I'm so happy and full of joy. And I'm, I'm just, thank you. Like, like that's when God revealed himself to me. That's when the spirit come upon me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I, bro, I had hair standing up on the back of my neck that I didn't even know I had. Like I was just. <laughs> And, and I'm like, holy cow, like God is real, you know? So I wrote this down, put it on a, a piece of paper, and I stuck it on my wall in my cell, and I always went back to this. I always read it. I always prayed it. And uh, little did I know that that was the start of, that was my calling. That was the start of my ministry. Hmm. And ever since that day, that moment, I couldn't stop reading my Bible. Like I'm reading it until it fell apart, right? Right. And, you know, I'm calling Benita. I'm telling her all the stuff. I'm learning the spirits teaching me, you know, all the stuff that my grandma had taught me as a kid is now coming back to me. I'm like, mm. oh, that's what my grandma was telling me, you know, mm -hmm. like it was making sense to me now. So anyway, come it's all I'm approaching my 30 days. Right. And and I'm like, man, I'm they're not coming to get me. Right now. I was trying to fight my extradition. So my lawyer in Ohio was trying to work with my lawyer in North Carolina to see that whatever time they were going to give me in Ohio, that I could just stay in North Carolina and do it there. That way I didn't have to move back or be right. transported back to Ohio. So I'm fighting that. So it's like the 29th day. And I went to the kiosk in the, in the pod of the jail and I, and I wrote 
who you know who this may concern you know my habeas corpus is, expires tomorrow i would like to exercise my right to go back in front of a judge to ask to be released right so i get a response and it's blank it doesn't say it's from anybody right it says in all caps be patient exclamation 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 and i'm like what the heck okay all right i'll be patient right that night it's now the 30th day after midnight like two or three o'clock in the morning hey sandella pack it up and i'm like what so I'm like, I'm thinking I'm going home, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, right. I'm going down. They're taking me down to the to, to where you change your clothes out at. And she's got all my clothes up on the counter. And then she pulls out this box and starts folding it up. And she's like, all right, put all your stuff in here. I'm like, for what? She's like, because wherever you're going, you can't take nothing with you. And I'm like, where, where am I going? She's like, <laughs> I don't know. Put it in here. Put the address you want to send it to. And I'm like, what is going on, right? But God had also told me now that I've been reading my Bible, he said, uh, pray that you may escape everything that's going to happen to you and may Jesus be pleased with you. Right. That instantly came to my mind and I started praying that. Right. Lord, please help me escape everything that's going to happen to me and may Jesus be pleased with me. So I'm praying it, praying it. Still don't know where I'm going. So they they put me in a holding cell. And now I sat in that holding cell until like noon the next day. And. Had no idea what was happening, where I was going. Nobody could give me an answer. Nobody could say anything. And, and the guy that I was in the holding cell with, I'm like, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm going to the Fed joint. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm going back to Ohio, right? Now I'm thinking Ohio's coming to pick me up. That's what I was thinking in my head. Mm -hmm. So at noon, these, these federal agents come walking in, and they're like, all right, let's go. Shackle up. Boom. And I'm like, where are we, where are we going? And it said Federal Bureau of Prisons on, on this badge. And put us on a bus, take us to Atlanta United States Penitentiary. And I'm like, holy cow. Like, I'm in the Fed joint. Like, what's going on here? So now I'm thinking that my case turned federal because I went on the run or whatever, right? I have no idea what's going on, right? They give me a Fed number, put me in the Feds, and... And, and I and I still don't know. So I'm praying this prayer. I'm praying this prayer. So finally, I realized that they had put a federal hold on me, which trumps everything, right? Because really, North Carolina wasn't allowed to let me leave until I went to court there and did my time there. Then Ohio could come and get me. But they sent me back to Ohio. They allowed Ohio to come and get me. And so they put a federal hold on me, which trumps the state. And they used the U.S. Marshals to transport me back to Ohio. Wow. So that's how they put me through the Fed system, right? So I'm, I'm, going, I'm in Atlanta. Then I fly on an airplane to Oklahoma City. Con Air. Con Air. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, and I had no idea what, what, you know, I seen the movie, but right. I was like, I'm legit on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's unfortunate, but not too many people in the world can say they flew on that plane, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Okay. So, it, I mean, it was un, unreal, bro. So I fly to Oklahoma City. I've been in Oklahoma City for a while. I fly from there to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and wow. then I take a bus from there to Youngstown, and I'm Youngstown. Then they take me finally to downtown Cleveland to the courthouse. Man, I, I had this whole time, people are gassing me up, telling me that my case turned federal and da-da-da. So when I was in Youngstown, the lady called me in the middle of the night on the speaker in my cell and was like, hey, you got court in the morning at 5 o'clock. And I'm like, no, I don't. She's like, yeah, you do. And I'm like, oh, man, my case really did go federal, right? Like, what are you talking about? So I'm like, can you at least let me out of here so I could call my wife and tell her? Like, you know, I, I, no one knows. My lawyer don't know. Nobody knows I have court tomorrow. Wow. So she lets me out to call. And the lady goes, let me ask you something. Do you believe in God? And I'm like, yeah, I do. She's like, well, what are you worried about? So they take me to the courthouse the next morning. I'm in there. And I'm 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 freaking out, bro. I don't know what's going on. I'm on in in this holding cell, praying that prayer. Lord, please help me escape all that's gonna happen to me. Right. About an hour goes by, I hear someone yell out, "Lake County's here to get one," and I just like, oh my, like crying. Thank you, God. Right. Thank you. And this and this deputy sheriff from Lake County comes and is like, "Hey, come on, shackle up." And I'm like, bro, listen, I know you've probably never heard this before in your life, but I am so happy to see you. <laughs> he's like, and he starts laughing. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, bro, I, I don't. I, I thought I was in the fair. I, I didn't know what was going on, but I'm, I'm glad you're here to get me, buddy. So I go back to Lake County. I sit in there for a few months until I go to sentencing. So what happened was I had took that plea deal, right? 
right? Mm-hmm. So I had to go back to Ohio. There was no way around uh, doing okay. my time in North Carolina, but everyone seemed to forget that or, or slip their mind or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So they transported me back, right? I go, I sit in there for a few months, go to sentencing. Now, the, the Holy Spirit inspired me to write a letter to my judge, and I did. And it was like 13 pages long, and I just spilled my guts to him. Told him, took accountability for what I did, told him why I chose to go on the run, what happened in North Carolina, you know, how Jesus saved my life, how he gave me the Holy Spirit. And, and I just went on and on and told him everything, right? And he read every single bit of that letter and he had mercy on me. He gave me jail time credit for all the time I had in transit back to Ohio, which he didn't have to. Plus it was federal time. That's all dead time, really, right? Mm. Gave me credit for all of it. Which was a couple months, it sounds like, at least. Oh, yeah, it was longer than that. Okay. It was probably six months. It was probably like six months. Six months, okay, okay. So he he sentenced me to a year. Like, I had five years over my head. Mm -hmm. Like, he could have sent me to the joint for five years. And he gave me a year with that time served. So now, by the time I get to the penitentiary, I only have six months left on my sentence. And I'm like, holy cow. So I ended up going to Portage County and had to face that. Mm-hmm. She gives me like an extra 10 months on top of that. So I had like 16 months I had to do. And uh, anyway, so North Carolina dropped everything. Wow. Right? Wow. Dropped everything. Didn't have any. I got out of prison. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a miracle. Miracle. That's what I'm saying. Bonafide. So looking back, like I could see the Lord's hand on my life. Now. Absolutely. And, yeah. and even the fact that day that I drove to those police, because they were coming to my house. And after they left that guy's house, they were coming to my house. Mm. And if I didn't put that stuff up in the ceiling, mm. they would have busted me with all that dope, all them guns, all that money. And, and I could have been doing 50 years in the feds. So as I'm in the feds. Right. I mm-hmm. couldn't understand why, like, why I was there at first, but the Lord was showing me this is where you could have been living, bro. Mm-hmm. In the Fed system, everything is segregated. Like they won't even room you or sell you with anybody outside of your own race. Oh, wow. They have their own TV rooms. That's one says blacks, one says whites, one says Hispanics. And that's who you, that's where you watch TV. That's who, that's who you eat dinner with. And I, I got to sit over here and eat dinner and breakfast with, with a bunch of white skinheads, white supremacists. <laughs> and I'm like, my the wife is nation. Yes. Wow. Bro. And my kids are white, black, and Spanish. So I got all three of those races. And here I got to sit with these knuckleheads and, and I hate it. Like I would have, but the Lord's like, this is what you could have been doing. Hmm. Right. This is the way you could have been living for the next 50 years. Right. So he was started teaching me things through this whole journey, through the whole process. Hmm. And um, so they let me out. I get out. I do my time. I get out and uh, they dropped all that stuff in North Carolina. I didn't have any probation or parole. I did my time. I was done. But through this journey, all these different institutions that I went to, I remembered this and people started flocking to me like young kids, bro. 18 years old were confessing murders to me and, wow. and, and coming it's and, like you're a priest or something. Yeah, exactly. They're like, okay. well, God forgive you for anything. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, as long as you're willing to admit it. And, uh, so he would come in, man, can we pray? And he'd start confessing this hmm. stuff to me and we would just, but no, like they were trusting me. But it wasn't me that they were trusting, right? It, it was, was it was, was the, the Christ, it, the yes. Christ in you that you were. Yes. So the other thing that I'm taking apart or away from this is that he also put you in a dark place mm-hmm. that you were finally at a point in your life that you were surrendering. Yes. And allowing his the light of Christ to be shown in this dark place. Absolutely. So th- these these guys, these people were coming up to you being drawn not to to Brian. Right, but to the, but to the to Christ. Christ. Yes. It, yes. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And and no one ever questioned me. Like I th- I found that amazing. Like no one ever said, "Well, w- what are you doing?" Right? Here, right? <laughs> like you're in jail with us, right? right Nobody right. ever said anything like that. Huh. But yeah. like, I would see like God revealed to me like laying hands on people and healing to prayer, right? And like that guy was, his mom was in the hospital. Something was happening to her, right? And he's like, hey, can we pray for her? And I'm like, put my hands on him, hmm. pray for his mom. And then the next day he's running around acting all crap. I'm like, yo, what's up? What happened with your mom? 
He's like, oh, nothing, man. They took the tubes out of her. They sent her home. Oh, and I'm like, that's awesome. You know, and I, and, and the Lord's starting to show me that and stuff. And building your faith. Yes, at, at okay. the same time. Okay. So yeah, it was it was it was so, absolutely outstanding. So you're so the verdicts and everything from all the dirt finally caught up with you. Yep. You're in this prison. Yep. You taking Christ in you through these prison cells. Yep. God starts moving in you, and this is the whole 16 months that you're in. I'm yep. assuming, and yep. it's probably just growing, and yep. your faith is growing, yep. and so now you're you're released. You're paroled. Yep. No, I'm released. No parole. No probation. No, just just out. Just out. Did my time. I'm done. Okay, so yep. you're you're out. Yep. And no, you know no, you're no, a no. pastor now. So from that point where you're just walk out. Yep. To right here. Yep. Take us through that part now. Okay. So because that's the redemptive it, arc. Yep. We don't want to necessarily, and I know you know this, like boast in, in or, or or glorify that. Right. Absolutely, you know, and, yeah. and you know, all joking aside, like you know, watching Breaking Bad or whatever, and that's yeah. entertaining. But the reality of it is, is like you said, you when you had your come to Jesus moment, mm -hmm. you it sounds like God just downloaded to you the the hurt. Yep. The devastation, the the spiritual murder, the emotional, the you know, all this stuff that that the devil was using you yep. as almost like a dark evangelist, yep. and God's redeeming that and in you for His glory. Yes, sir. Right, taking you to this other other place in your life now. Yeah. So what? Okay, so you're re you're released. Yep. So in in that in that time too, while I was locked up, Benita gets saved. Right. So now oh, we're okay. Right? Okay. So now we're reading our Bible together every night on the phone. We're we're spending like all this money on phone calls from the prison just so her and I can read the Bible together. And um so I get out and we stay like I'm like, look, God has given me the second chance, right? And I and I want to do everything that pleases him. I want to do this whole thing the right way, right? Right. So we're not married. So we stay in Ohio. We stay at my mom's house. We sleep separate from each other. So she moved back up. From North Carolina, no, we're still technically everything's in North Carolina still. Okay, okay, okay. but she comes up to get me out, right? Because I, I okay. finished my time at Lake Erie, right here in Conneaut, right? Okay. So we stay at my mom's house, which is in Menor. We sleep separate from each other. Okay. We don't sleep together, right? Now, mind you, the lifestyle I used to live. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So, right. brother, that's how that, that's how the Lord showed me His Spirit was real. That right? radical of a shift <laughs> that only and you and I were talking before we recorded about the need of our heart being wicked yep. and deceitful, yep. and God having to create a new heart within us. But a couple episodes ago, Mrs. Smith was here and we were talking about like God having to create a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us. Yep. And you're, what you are saying is the real life evidential proof of that happening. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And also in Benita. Yes. So as a family unit, God is working in it's separately, but together at the same time, miles, you know, yep. as far apart as you were yep. bringing you both together under Christ. Yep. So, so you guys get married, we get married, you make it official, we get married at the end of that week. Okay. Right? And then we move back to North Carolina Okay. and move into a different house than the one that we lived in before we were married. Okay. Like before I went to prison. Right. Mm -hmm. So. We're there for a couple of years and we got a great church. We have, I have a good job. Um, so does she, we're, we're productive members in our community. I'm coaching baseball again, hmm. right? My name's not ruined down there and anybody, you know, they didn't know, they didn't know about my past, but if they did, they didn't even care because they knew who I was now. They, right? they saw the change. Well, they, right. they, they, they knew me from the changed. Right? right. So they're like, what? You used to do that. Yeah. Right. They didn't even believe it. Right? right. So I felt the Lord calling me back to Ohio and I'm like, Lord, seriously, like, <laughs> I'm like, you, you just, <laughs> I'm like, you make it, you make it, you, you, if you make it clear to me and if this is really what you want, I'm going to do it. You know that. Right. So I even had my dad, right, who's close to me, telling me, what the heck do you want to come back here for? There's nothing here for you. You got a good job. You got a nice house. You got a uh, nice church. You're, you know, you're making money. You got nice, everything you, you want, everything. everything you need. Yeah. And why do you, there ain't nothing down here up here for you, right? Nothing but trouble. And, and you know what? He's right in all that stuff that he was saying. But the Lord's saying no. He made it clear to me. Yeah, come back. 
Hmm. And see here for the first, you know, I have two older boys that lived up here and I thought it was because of them, which it's, it is too, but right. I thought that was the only reason, right? We make a, a plan, Benita and I, let's just put a plan into place. We'll wait till after the first of the year when work dies down, we'll move during the winter. That'll give us a couple months to get established, but by then it'll be spring. I could get back in the union, go right back into asphalt and we'll be good. So she's like, okay. So that was our plan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so one day she's like, man, why don't you call the bank and, and just check on our credit, see if there's anything we got to work on. Um, maybe, maybe we could buy a house when we move back. So we don't have to rent or live with your parents for a while. I'm like, okay, yeah, right. Right. You know, like I, I didn't think I'd ever be in a position to buy a house and I, and I was cool with that. I didn't care. So I call the bank, I give the lady the information and she calls me back a couple of days later, says, okay, you're approved. Go ahead and start looking. Hmm. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So now we're in North Carolina trying to buy a house in Ohio and we can't come back and forth like that. Right. So my parents are looking at houses for us. They're calling us on FaceTime. Da da da. So anyway, over that process, coach Bob, right. Bob Yule, who yes, was my, my brother. <laughs> so the, the common link with, with Brian and I is that I, my baseball coach when I was a wee young lad, um, is a, a brother in Christ, a great man. He yes. and his wife, uh, I, I can't call him Bob. I call him coach because I, <laughs> I just, how it was, but, uh, and, and this is your, um, you run into yeah. oddly enough, because my connection with him as a baseball coach, yep. you're a baseball dude and he, you know, and he's a brother and you run into him. Well, so, so he actually used to minister to me in prison. He, he, yeah, he uh, yeah. yeah. The Cairo's retreat. That's how him right. and I met. Right. So anyway, he, he's like, listen, I got a Cairo's brother, another brother in Christ. That's a real estate agent. I'm going to hook you up with him. Hmm. Right. I'm like, all right, cool. So he hooks me up with him. I'm, I'm realizing, man, this is a Christian brother. I could trust him. He's not going to try to rip me off or make a buck off of me or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So after we're looking for houses, he says, Hey, I got, I got another Christian brother. That's a finance guy. Why don't you reach out to him? I think he can help you. Right. Mm -hmm. So call him. And now I'm realizing God's placing these men in my life. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So he's like, man, Brian in Ohio, being a first time home buyer. Well, first of all, he, approved me for $50,000 more than my bank did. And he's like, being a first time home buyer, we'll give you 5% down payment assistance. And as long as you live there for seven years, you don't have to pay it back. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. And then Steve, right. My realtor got the, the, the sellers to pay the closing costs, but I didn't come out of anything out of pocket for right. my house, but $400 for an, ex an inspection, inspection. Right. bought a house. Yeah. Never thought I'd ever be able to. Right. So now I'm realizing that the Lord's given me confirmation. Yes. I want you back here in Ohio. Right. Cause mm -hmm. I didn't have to kick any doors open, knock any down. I just had to walk through them. Right. Mm -hmm. So now we're back in Ohio. We're, 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 we're stabbed. We're moving to our house. Now, the whole time, I'm still thinking there's a catch to it. I'm thinking the bank's going to find something out, right. and they're going to come back and take the keys from me or something, right, right. right? So we get there. Benita was working for the, the state of North Carolina, but she worked from home. Well, she said, hey, I just want to let you guys know we moved to Ohio. I just want to let you know. Boom, they fired her on the spot. So now she loses her job. Then our whole house gets COVID, right? So I can't even go to work at my new job for like a, over a month. Hmm. And I'm tripping. I'm like, Lord. How the, I got this brand new house, this brand new car. How the heck am I supposed to pay for it? Right. He's like, well, how do you think you got that house? Uh, you think I brought you all the way back here to just drop you on your head and leave you for dead? And, I, and I'm like, so he, he was starting to teach me things and prepare me for what lied ahead and taught me to depend on him and not on my money. Anyway, we were also having a hard time finding a church. And I mean, hard time, like half of these churches, I wanted to grab my family and run out the front door with them. Yeah, I can relate. You can relate. Yeah. So I'm pumping, the, pumping the brakes. I'm watching my old church from North Carolina online. And I almost felt a sense of guilt from doing that. You know, like I need to be a part of the body. I want to go out, you know? So we started a Bible study in the meantime, and, uh, we would meet in, at our house on Friday and we would, we would make a meal, we'd read the word, we'd pray together. And I'm like, this is cool. At least we know we're getting the word. It's not watered down. We're praying together. We're eating together, breaking bread together. Then, then, a, then a gentleman came along and started leading us in worship. Now we're worshiping together. And I'm like, man, we're, we're a church, right? It's coming together. It's coming together slowly but surely. But I mean, there was even people that had left 
because I wouldn't tell everybody we were a church. And I'm like, just relax. Like, why? Why right. we are what we are? Like, what, what's the big deal, right? So then, even though, even long story short, even when we came to transition into a church, the you know the people would make comments. Well, now you want to tell people you're a church, ha ha, you're fu-, you know all that stuff. But so we're 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 meeting, we're having Bible study, and it's going on, you know, for a few months. And uh, I, I felt the urge to go out and start looking for a church again. So I'm going. I'm and I and I always drove past willow praise mm-hmm. but i never went there and i went to the car wash every day right next to it and i see it and finally the lord's like go there right so i'm like all right get out of the car wash i go in there walk in and and the secretary sister lydia she comes up you know greets me with open arms starts telling me all about it and we're, we're sharing testimonies we're praying together she's showing me around the building telling me about pastor and i'm giving him your number and she starts talking about this dinner church that they have mm-hmm. and i'm like oh we got kind of like that, that going on at my house and she's like what so pastor wants to come and check it out so he pastor larry he comes over and checks out our bible study you know so i go visit the church then i then i take benita i'm like man you gotta check this church out man i think this might be the one right so she goes and she's like, yeah, Brian, I think this is it. So I set up a meeting with Pastor Larry. I go sit down with him. I'm like, well, Pastor, I think we finally found our home. And he looks at me side eye and he's like, well, you, you, could, you could come here if you want to, but, but your ministry's at your house, man. Why do why, why you want to stop what God is doing? And I'm like, what? I'm like, God, I finally find a church and now the pastor's telling me not to come here. But, you know, I had right. to realize his, his, he was concerned about the move of God. Right. He wasn't concerned about what I could bring his church or, or sit yeah. on his, you know what I'm saying? Right. Well, in another connection you and I have is that Larry, uh, Pastor Larry Bogenreath at Will of Praise. Yeah. When I first got saved was the first pastor I sat under like really? 25 years ago or however long it was since Jesus introduced himself to me. So I've known Larry like my entire Christian, Christian life. life. <laughs> and and we so my wife and I have been looking for a church for a very long time. So I really can empathize with you and, and how I want an, another connection we have is that Larry's like, Oh, you need to talk to Brian. He goes, you guys would get on really well or whatever. So, you know, the synergy, but so at that point, Larry's like, dude, wow, you can come here, but God's moving at your house. Yep. This is where you need to begin to lay the foundation for a move that God wants to use you and Benita in, yep. in the community. So, so you were doing that. And so once he told you that you guys were doing that in that form that I, I'll say a pre-church, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're getting the, the foundation laid, you're, you're establishing yep. and, and it's brought you to this point now where God has been faithful mm-hmm. and you're blown out your home be, and there's no more room, no more room. And people who listen to us regularly, are, I, I believe just at this point are going to feel the excitement in their spirit like I do. Mm-hmm. But the, where you're at now versus, you know, where God has brought you through that whole journey to where you're at now, let talk about that because to me, that's going to kind of spit in the eye of the devil and the other plans that he had for you and, and, and the lives that he was using you to destroy. But now God has, has raised you up. You know, the scriptures say, if you humble yourself, God will raise you up in due time. Mm-hmm. So now you're at this point where you guys have a building, you're meeting, you're growing. And, and so tell us about that and where you're at now and kind of maybe moving forward, what you can share. So we are at, um, we partnered with a family, uh, that has has been coming to our church for quite a while, you know, even since we were in my living room. And um they own a a, a non profit Christian daycare uh in the city of Euclid. Um and they offered us, hey, you know, we only use this building Monday through Friday from, you know, seven to five. You're more than welcome. And and they told me that a long time ago and it, and I just kept it on the back burner to make sure that, hey, this is mm-hmm. this really what God wants me to do. You know, I'm not gonna anything sounds good, right? So um We got test the spirits. That's right. And 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 praying and, and just following God's lead, he said, Boom, it's time. So as of July, July sixteenth was our first service there. We we moved to transition from my home. Uh, to this building and it's just been bro we've been reaching people from the daycare uh have been coming the families that attend the daycare um 
you, you know, we, we, we've grown a little bit and we've, uh, we've established a website. What's and that website it's, real it's, quick? It's uh, choflivingstones.com. Okay. And, uh, I mean, we've done a lot of things over these, over these past years, man. Um, and it just, it seems like it, it that this has always been our life, but you mm. think you, you look back at it, it's only been a couple of years and you're like, well, right. You know? Yeah. And God has just been moving, man. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I say this and I'll tell anybody this, that it's because of obedience. It's just obedience and, and waiting on the Lord. When he right. says, go, go, when he says, stay, stay, you know, it's, it's don't ever get ahead of God. You know, we get in as human beings, we tend to always want to try to figure stuff out for ourselves or figure out the best scenarios and how we're going to make things work. But man, if you just sit back and, and just let God do the work in and right. you do the walk in, <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, it's unbelievable what he does. Well, and I, I say in the podcast all the time that we have a part to play and God has a part to play. Mm -hmm. We can't do God's part and he won't do our part. Yep. So everything that you're saying, I, I think just exemplifies that. Amen. So, Amen. so I love these kind of stories because to me, it personalizes like, you, you know, it's not one of these, you know, you can watch a movie or a documentary or whatever about, oh, there's this person and you look at them. But it, it's like in real life, like a story that a, a redemptive story that God brings somebody from a, a place of despair and danger and darkness into where he's literally the hand he transforms that person to where you could become God's hands and God's feet and and how God is no respecter of person and that that's not just something um like your call is unique to you Brian yeah. but the people listening to this or who will listen to this God has a unique call and a purpose for them as well yes. and and I know like for myself I can discount myself because you know I know what I battle with or I know what I've done or you know whatever but that stuff, once it's re you're repented and it's under the blood, mm -hmm. you like you can probably sit there and, and beat yourself up for the years and the, the whatever this and I did this and blah blah blah. Yeah. But instead of wasting that, and you probably do fight that. I'm sure you're human, but instead of that, you're like I'm I'm pushing that back and I'm moving forward and what Christ has for me, for my family and, and for this area. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a lot of things that you've been involved in, like the hope delivered, which is a big event here. I know you guys okay. is a relatively newer and smaller church, like being a part of that and helping, yeah. you know, in our neighborhood. And I know one of the things I do admire because I feel like, and I can just attest to this myself being who I am and what I've come from, like marriages are under attack. So not only do we want to celebrate the church house that God is establishing through you and Benita, mm -hmm. but you guys are also starting, and maybe this will be a yearly thing. I don't know. That'd be cool. But you guys are also sewing into the idea of marriage yes. and the sanctity of marriage. And you have an upcoming event yes. that I just want to give you a couple moments to talk about because the missus and I are planning on the coming, uh, but I think it's so important. So talk just real briefly about this, the, the name of it, where, you know, people can get the information and what's going on, who's going to be there, you know, whatever. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're having a, a marriage uh, conference at our at our church um, December 1st and 2nd our special guest pastors and speakers are going to be Pastor Juan Martinez and his wife Ruth Pastor Ernesto Perez and his wife Asinet and uh, they are from Get Rap Church in Houston Texas and they're also uh, affiliated with Kingdom Music I know a lot of people know Brian T and Kingdom Music who we've also partnered with and done an event with over this past couple years we've done some prison ministry with them and we've we've really grown in relationship with this whole ministry and um Pastor Juan and and Pastor Ernesto they they host this event it's called Love Wins and they and they host it once a year in Houston Texas and they've extended us the grace to do it here in Ohio for the first time so it's titled Love Wins Ohio and I like to I like to say it this way that it's more of a relationship conference it's geared towards married couples but no matter where you are in your relationship journey whether you're engaged dating um, even single right that uh, you would use these these principles and foundations towards your future marriage. So so Friday night, 
it's going to be awesome. It's going to be quote unquote prom night, right? <laughs> so we dress up um, like we're going to the prom and we're going to have a catered dinner. We're going to have a DJ dancing. Um, we're going to have Pastor Juan is actually going to speak that night too. And we're going to have, uh, you know, prizes and giveaways. We're going to crown a prom king and a prom queen. And uh, so that's Friday. So Friday night is just reserved for couples only. Now, Saturday is more of the teaching and the conference part that's going to be open to anyone, single, whoever. So so there is a price. It's a $120 per couple, and that gets your admission for both days, dinner, The lunch. Friday night, the prom, and then yep. Saturday, yes, sir. the all, all day, the, okay. Yes, and, okay. Then, and then Saturday only, is, uh, and it's $30, and that will include your lunch for the day, and then all you know all the teaching and the conference mm-hmm. for that. And if you just want to come Saturday, is that, that's an Yeah, option? that's possible, too. You can okay. just come Saturday. So you get your ticket. We, we created an event on Eventbrite. Love wins Ohio. And it also has, you know, a brief description of what to expect and, you know, all that kind of stuff and our location. But you can also go on our website, uh, choflivingstones.com, and just click, you know, get tickets. It'll show you a small okay. promotional video and things like that on there. Awesome. So it's, it's exciting, bro. I'm, it's going to be so exciting. Yeah. Um, Marriage isn't easy. Yeah. It's not. It's not. <laughs> and, um, but it's worth it. Yeah. When it works, it's awesome. Yeah. When it's not, and a lot of that is stuff I'm hopeful that, you know, the trips to communicate to, you know, to, you know, prefer the, I, I'm just excited. I, I, like I said, I think we're probably going to be able to come Saturday, Good. but I'm excited to, you know, invest not just into ourselves, but also what you guys are doing. And I, I yeah, think man. it's so important that churches begin to invest in relationships yes. like this because they are the cornerstone of the community that God created. He, yeah. The first thing he ever did was Adam and Eve. He created the family. He created yeah. the, the husband and the wife. Yeah. So my hat's off to you. I applaud you guys, uh, you and Benita both, for being able to take the initiative and and, and, uh, and do this. So, uh, um, man, I just I want to thank you for coming because I've known you for a little bit now. And I some of the stuff I already knew you shared, but a lot of this was new. It just it never ceases to amaze me what the world, and I mean this respectfully because I'm like emotional just thinking about this, like what people would just discard. Mm-hmm. And just discount trash out, you know, whatever. God says no. I'm, right. I'm, I'm picking that up. I'm dusting that off. Mm-hmm. I have redemptive purposes, mm-hmm. and it never ceases to amaze me that even now that God is is doing that. So yes. I would ask, just say a prayer, just yeah. say a blessing uh, over the listeners, uh, and, and whatever you know. If God lays anything else in your heart, have at it. You got you know. But if you could do that as we're bringing this to an end, that'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah. Just to reference what you just said real quick, you know, if, if, if you count anybody out, then you can't count because you can't count anybody out with Jesus. He can save if he can save a, a, a knucklehead and a wretch like me, he can save anybody. Yeah. So Amen. take that for encouragement for the day. I yeah. know that, you know, even your listeners, Bill, you, you might have people that are battling with addiction or, or alcoholism or, or whatever the case may be. And they're the black sheep of your family. And you're like, hey, that guy's never going to change. That girl's never going to change. They said the same thing about me. So don't ever give up on them. Keep praying for yeah. them. Awesome. Amen. Yeah. 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 Amen. All right. Let's let's pray. Father, I thank you for I thank you for this honor and this privilege of uh, Bill inviting me to come and you know share my story. Lord, I pray that it that it's able to help somebody, um, build them up, give them courage, give them hope uh, for their future. Lord, because like Bill said at the beginning of this, our testimony is so powerful that it makes Jesus become real to people. Uh, people think, well, man, if he did that for them, then, then he could do this for me. And, um, and it breaks it chisels away at that, at that heart and heart a little bit more and a little bit more. And father, we just ask for everybody that's in attendance, people that are listening live, people that are going to listen to this in the future. Father, we just ask that you bless them, you bless them that you continue seeking them out, you know, knocking on their door, Lord. I pray that you give them the courage uh, to answer your call, to open up that door, and, and they you come inside and make your home with them, Lord. And, um, again, I thank you, uh, Father, for this opportunity, this privilege to sit here with my brother and, and share about the goodness of God. You know, we don't want to glorify these bad things, but we're testifying to the goodness of God and the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. And you saved me, Lord. I know you saved Bill too. Not everybody's story is the same. Um, 
but the restoration, the healing, and, 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 and all things becoming new is the same, Father. And we thank you for it. We give you all praise, all honor, all glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome, man. I, dude, thank you. Yeah, this, thank you. I believe this is such a powerful thing. And as the people are listening to this now, you know, I ask you guys to share, and I hope you are. But these are the messages that need to go out. Like, Brian, you just said, man, like, you can't count people out. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, God is no respecter of person. So, you know somebody out there that's, like, struggling or that's, like, you know, in a place where you're like, how can God reach them? Or, you know, yes. they're, they're beyond hope or whatever you, whatever you would say. <laughs> Brian would sit here and say, uh, not so fast. That's right. Not so fast. <laughs> um, so I love you, man. Thank love you for you coming. Too, and you. Um, you guys, uh, I'm going to put the links to uh, the church website, and then um, I'm going to put the links to Love Wins Ohio. Yes. Uh, also in the description. So whether you're listening on uh, any of the podcast platforms or you're listening on Rumble, um, they'll be there. Check out. Uh, the church, if you can make it, if you're in the Lake County, uh, the, the Northeast Ohio area, mm -hmm. um, they're right off of Lakeshore Two in Euclid, six. right after, right over the Lake County line, yep. uh, right where Lake County and Cuyahoga kind of meet. Uh, so, you know, just check it, check it out, check that stuff out. And, um, you know, remember to keep listening and keep checking us out. Uh, we're anywhere podcasts are Flawcast CLE. We're on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Breaker, Anchor.fm. You can also find us on Rumble, uh, Flawcast CLE, uh, Flawed Inc. on Rumble. Uh, we're on the Project Mockingbird social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Getter, and Gab, all under Flawed Inc. Link is below for uh, my book, Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. Uh, Flawed Inc. CLE at gmail.com is the email address. So uh, reach out to us. If you want to get in touch with Brian, um, send us an email or a message, and I, I'll make sure you guys can connect or you know, I'll give you whatever. Because uh, I definitely think he's somebody that is worth at least speaking to. And if you have questions i know he's going to come at you as authentically with the word that he can and you're not going to sugarcoat it and, and just be as up real and up front so um and that's a credit to you my friend but uh thanks for listening guys and we will see you next week